Holland Festival 1967. Op 19 juni jongstleden werd in het concertgebouw in Amsterdam een recital gegeven door de Italiaanse bariton Renato Capecchi en zijn landgenote de clavecinisten Maria Isabella De Carli. Deze voordracht droeg de titel Monteverdi en de anderen. Renato Capecchi gaf zelf de toelichtingen bij de door hem te zingen liederen van Monteverdi en diens tijdgenoten. and Renato Capecchi. <laughs> we shall try to speak and sing something about Monteverdi and the other people. First, I must say to you that Monteverdi was very good in music, but really very bad in English, as I am. <laughs> so excuse me if I read because I wrote that in Italian, but after, as a good pupil, I translate. So I read now. Claudio Giovanni, Claudio Monteverdi and the others. This year, this year, as we are celebrating Monteverdi, everyone is talking about, writing about, and singing Monteverdi. That very well. But the others, the ones that formed the background for the genius. Claudio Giovanni Antonio Monteverdi lived between the 16th and 17th century. In that period, Italy was politically divided into many small and even tiny states, governed by dukes and princes, some rich, some poor, some honest, many dishonest, but all of them competing to support the art. It was a golden age for the art. Any occasion was good for celebrations and festivals at the court or in the public places. The princes themselves played instruments and acted in plays. The duchess sang and danced. The ambassadors were busier with artistic espionage than with politics. <laughs> it was their job to tell their master who were the outstanding artists in each field. They set up cultural exchanges. If you give me a sculptor, I will give you a counter tenor. If you give me trombones, I will you give trumpets and drums. Sometimes the negotiation ended up with diplomatic incidents, <laughs> normal, because the artist on loan, lured by gifts and bribes, would not go back home, but would change to the new pattern, normal. But who, by the way, were the greatest patrons. The Pope in Rome, the Republic of Venice, Medici in Firenze, and the Gonzaga in Mantova. In fact, it was in Mantova that Monteverdi began his career as a musician. First, he was a violist for the Gonzagas. Then, he became choir master of the Cathedral of Mantova. It was in Mantua that he put into practice the first news of the cultural revolution which had taken place in Florence, which led to the birth of the melodrama, that is, drama in music. In October 1600, the marriage of Maria de' Medici and Henri IV de France was celebrated in Florence. There were many guests, great parties, and naturally performances. We could, as, uh, we, we could say that uh, Premier Mondial. They put on Euridice by Jacopo Peri. It was a strange spectacle made up of song, music, pantomime, and dance. Quite a mixture, but entertaining, for the music followed the words. The gestures fitted the text, and the dancing showed the emotions. These were the first fruits of theories created in the house of Count Giovanni di Bardi di Vernio, where a group of men of letters and musicians, the Accademia Florentina, a sort of literary club, met. 
style of academic polyphonic writing, they tried to return to the splendor of the Greek theater. But the basis for their theories was what they called truth of expression, that is, an intentional relationship between music and language, between vocal art and instrumental art. Well, melodrama was being born. The first attempt at melodrama is attributed to Emilio de Cavalieri, or del Cavaliere, or Cavaliere with two L. Nobody knows exactly the name. It was performed in 1590 in Rome, in a church. The only theatrical composition which we have by Cavalieri the is the Rappresentazione di Anima e di Corpo, representation of soul and body, performed in February 1600 in Rome. It is a spiritual melodrama from which I shall sing the monologue of time. For that occasion, monologue was transformed into a character. The text. It's very strange, heavy text. <laughs> Time flies, life ends. It already seems that I can hear the last trumpet saying, come out of the grave, shattered ashes and bones. Rise up on as a soul again, take your bodies now, come tell the truth. Whether it was a better idea to serve the vain world or the king of the high heaven, so that everyone understands, opens his eyes, and realizes that this life is wind, which flies away in a moment. Today he comes forth, tomorrow he dies. Today he appears, tomorrow disappears. So each should try while he has time to leave what is of the world, however joyful it may be in itself, and work with his hands and work with his heart, because of good works, honor is the fruit. Ah, I shall try to remember Cavalieri's instruction to the lettori, in that case performers. In singing, he says, this I suggest, passing from one effect to another contrasting one, from sad to happy, from fierce, fierce to mild, and so forth which will be most touching. Man. 
It does not seem that Monteverdi ever had a chance to see a show by Emilio de Cavalieri per anno. However, it is very probable that he was able to attend the performance of Euridice by Jacopo Peri, with the text by Rinuccini, which took place eight months later in Florence. In fact, he must even have gotten copies of the music from the protagonist Francesco Rasi, a noble, singer, and poet who had lo been loaned from, for the occasion to the Medicis by Duke Vincenzo Gonzaga. Now you will hear the shepherd's song from Euridice. It is an invitation to nymphs and shepherds for the wedding of Orpheus and Euridice. <laughs> must not have been very fond of Marco da Galliano. He was a priest, a Florentine, and a choir master at San Lorenzo in Firenze and at the Medici's court. He tried more than once to get a job at the court of Mantova. He wrote music for the Gonzaga, got them to put on his best work, and what is really incredible, was highly paid for it by the Gonzaga who, as we know, were very tight-fisted with poor Monteverdi. Anyway, Marco da Galliano was a good musician, but today he is almost unknown. I shall sing the aria Spento il fuoco e rotto il nodo from the fifth act of his, of his Flora. A lover, finally freed from a love which has begun to bore him, lets off steam by criticizing his former mistress. Too often, he repeats, we poor foolish lovers a laugh at your cries. He doesn't seem to so uh, he doesn't seem so very sure of himself. <coughs> Vivo, lieto, godo, mi adoro. 
The most famous member of the Accademia dei Bardi was Giulio Caccini, called Romano, because it seems that he was born in Tivoli, a little town near Rome. According to a letter of Emilio de Cavalieri, he was secretary to Count Bardi himself. He was extremely famous for his mastery of singing and his refined technique. As a composer of opera, it is amusing to recall that two months after Prairie's Euridice has been performed, he gave in Florence his own version with the same text by Renicini. Why? He was angry at Perry's great success for which he had loaned Perry almost his whole family. Yes, because in fact, in the Caccini house, there were six singers, Giulio, the father, Lucia, Margherita, Pompeo, Francesco, and Settinia, the most famous. They were all very good. And like opera stars today, <laughs> they wanted to have their own way. They had, in fact, made Perry use their own arias written for them by Giulio, who was father, husband, and teacher. I have already said that Giulio, even today, is recognized as a great expert in the art of singing for his studies of breathing, of interpretation, which he called sprezzatura, that is, immediacy of expression with dynamic and rhythmic variation, sospensioni and volatine, embellishment and colorature. Caccini's aria are usually the first one 
which a single singing teacher gives to his pupils, and they are considered the first arias in the Italian sense. You will hear two ariette by Caccini. The first, Odi Eutepe, Lichten Muse, tells in slightly daring fashion about a night of love. So, the mood, a bed, a woman, una, woman breasts, and the, uh, etc. <laughs> And now, Amarilli, and with that, the heavy part is gone. Amarilli is the name of a beautiful girl. The text, I love you, don't you believe me? Kill me, open up my heart, and you will read your name, eternal story.
At this point, I should like to make a small explanation. I said that monody was born as a revolt against polyphony. Why? Because whereas in, in the Italian Renaissance, all the arts, and in particular the plastic arts, had aimed at the imitation of men, attitude, gestures, passion, of the, and of the nature, music became academic. The Middle Ages, had created polyphony, especially as a form of religious expression. The Flemish had brought it to an amazing degree of virtuosity. The Italians were able only to copy, to imitate. From the masterpieces of the Greek masters, theoreticians created an extremely complicated system of procedures, of recipes. Thus, music grew away from life. What was left was popular song. I should like to have you hear some example of this. First, however, as a homage to Flemish art, you will hear here a Richard Carey by Adrian Willer, who was choir master at St. Mark's in Venice. When Monteverdi spoke of him, he called him Il Divino, the Divine.
Now Sigismondo d'India, a Sicilian noble at the court of Savoy. He is an independent, both as poet and musician. He does not follow any particular school. As a polyphonist, he is nothing exceptional. As a monodist, well, listen to these passages and then judge. The lamento of Jasone over his stones killed by Medea. Antide mi pur doglio di affanni poi che non trovo roba al mio lampire Ravite mi pur che ho voi
come in a point, cantando insieme the qualità che ci Dove il ridotto del popolo di Torino, il fatto della grandezza, ecco a terra caduto il pregio e il vanto del mio trono reale. Ho caduto a morfare, ho patria desolata, ho frale speme, ho regno estinto, ho mio perduto pare. Claudio Juan Antoni Monteverdi, a man that seems legendary. The bibliography about him is immense, but as an interpreter, I shall leave aesthetic judgments to others. I shall limit myself to odd some bits of information. He was born in Cremona in 1567. Now, this year, we know from Elia Santoro, that he was born exactly on the 15th of May. We did not use to know anything about his mother. Today, this year, we know from his father's testament that she was named Maddalena and was the daughter of a goldsmith. We know that his father was named Baldassar and that he was a surgeon. As to the surname, I want to point out that only in the Renaissance did surnames begin to be fixed for individual families, but they still were not settled by law. Thus, it may seem strange that the birth 
certificate has Monteverdo. The final O is a dialectical form. The father sent his name Monteverde, probably because the name showed where the family had come from. When the father wrote of the son, he always wrote Monteverdi. Claudio sent his name Monteverdi, probably because during his lifetime, surnames ending in I, very common in Italy today, were gaining ground. A linguistic detail, the final E of Italian surnames come from the plural of denomination and not from the patronymic genitive of Latin, having the value of the various forms as uh, uh, of son in Dutch, son in English, sen in Danish, the Scotch mac, the English and Scottish fit, which derives from the French fi. We only have one engraving of, Mont of Monteverdi, the engraving is on the program, which besides is anonymous. Around the medaillon is written Monte, a line, Verde. There are still some Monteverdis living in Cremona. All autographs have disappeared, and today of his we have only one symphony, some notes, and about 100 20 letters. Here is a little song, a canzonetta, a song for, lo uh, for the lost love. Eri già tutta mia. Eri già tutta mia, mia per l'alme quel sole, di da me di da Volato d'amore, oh, bellezza valore, o oh, mirabile costanza, dove stai tu? E di da tutta mia, or non sei più, non più, non più, non più, non più. Characteristic of Monteverdi's art is his extreme liberty from any theory in order to achieve the most intense expression possible with the greatest simplicity of means. An example, la lettera amorosa, a love letter for solo voice without, sung without beat. The test is dream for man. And it's all about a woman hair, blonde hair. Mm -hmm. 
genius of Monteverdi is generally dramatic and representative. When he, he finally found a text with, which satisfied him, the battle between Tancredi and Clorinda, from Torquato Tasso's Gerusalemme Liberata, he set it to music, daring to use that style which he called concitato or excited. The performers of the day protested and laughed at it, but today, what would we do without the tremolo kata 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 kata, or the strappato clang? You do remember the battle of Tancredi and Florinda? Listen. <coughs> Monteverdi en de anderen. Dat was het onderwerp van een causerie recital door de bariton Renato Capecchi. Er werd aan het trapezimmel begeleid door Maria Isabella De Carli. 
U hebt geluisterd naar de opname van een concert dat in het kader van het Holland Festival 1967 op 19 juni jongstleden werd gegeven in het concertgebouw in Amsterdam.